Junki Ida painted this scroll in 1960 when he came to Seattle for four months to install the Seattle Japanese Garden. He was 70 years old and quite a well-known uh, landscape person in, in Japan. He had been awarded the Emperor's Prize and it was actually the first time in the history of the prize that it had been given for a landscape designer. Viewing the scroll in the long, narrow format is much like strolling through a garden where each step you see a new vista. The medium of the painting is sumi, or ink painting, which is the traditional art medium used in Japan and most of Asia. So there are two kinds of inks in, um, in sumi painting. Uh, one is the pine uh, sourced ink and the other is the oil sourced ink and they actually produce different colors. They're slightly different tints. The pine produces a blue tinge and the oil produces a brown tinge. For example, this looks like it might be brown. So it could be an oil-based ink. And to the soot, to make the cakes or sticks of ink, they add a type of glue. And the glue traditionally has been made from boiling the skins of donkeys or sometimes from the boiling the bones of fish. The style he used to paint the images is called the outline style, where there is no shading, no washes used, no color. And so the three-dimensional factor which he creates is sheerly by the use of line. And in this sense, it is close to calligraphy. In the first section of the scroll, we have the trees. And it's interesting that Juki Ida started with trees because his speciality was actually the woodland section of a garden. And so we have a maple tree, probably a ginkgo tree, and many, many evergreen trees. You can really see that he used just one brush because the, the brush strokes are all of one thickness. Well, he, it's thin where he lifted the brush and just used the tip, but they're generally of one size with some variation. In this tree, you can see that he used one brush full of paint on, his, uh, on the brush and used it until the end. You can see here that the, the ink is very rich and very full and he, as he goes towards the bottom of the tree you can see that the strokes have become dry as the brush ran out of ink. And th this is a principle in calligraphy, especially Japanese calligraphy, that you respect the brush and you use the complete brush full of ink until it is completely dry. In this tree he used the tip of the brush, uh, the very pointed tip, and pressed down so he could create triangular strokes. In this stroke, he pressed down lightly and lifted up so you can see the little tails here. In this stroke, it's just dotting like this, also the tip of the, the brush. In this tree, also with the tip of the brush, he made curved lines to create entirely different texture. The evergreen tree is very important in the Japanese garden and it usually comprises 80% of all the trees. The designers of the garden feel that with the evergreen trees you see the seasons more subtly uh, reflected than in deciduous trees. In deciduous trees you have the foliage and then the loss of the foliage and its bare limbs. But in the evergreen tree, you see it in the first flush in the spring, then in the verdant green during the summer, then as it gets darker green in the fall, and then it seems to shiver in the winter. And so you see more subtle changes in evergreen trees. The second scene on the scroll is of a very calm pond uh, surrounded by rocks. The water feature in a Japanese garden is very important because it presents a horizontal surface 
which contrasts with the vertical rocks and the trees. The flat horizontal surface also reflects the sky, and so in one glance you can see the heavens and the earth. There is a small waterfall here in this uh, pond scene, and this was another speciality of Juki Ida. He was noted for his woodland scenes, his woodland pl plantings, and his creation of waterfalls. And the bridges are to remind us that the human being is here, that the human being is present in this nature. The third grouping of images is of rocks. And the rocks in a Japanese garden are the bones of the garden, the structure, the form of the garden. This is the pond, and he used very angular strokes to create the rocks around it. And he has this axe a stroke where you use the side of the stroke to create depth or chiseling, in this case, of the rocks. The groupings of rocks show both horizontal and vertical rocks. At the far end of the scroll, at this left-hand end of the scroll, you see dots, which could be moss, on the rocks. But in actual fact, from a distance, they could be trees dotting distant mountains. The installer of the rocks in Seattle's garden was Richard Yamasaki, who did not really speak Japanese. He understood Japanese, but did not speak it uh, very well. But he was chosen by Juki Ida to lay the stones for the garden, to create the, the bones of the garden. At the end of the scroll, we come to Juki Ida's signature. And here you have Juki and Ga. Juki is his name, which means the Ten Fundamentals and ga is the word for picture. And this is the traditional way of signing a painting in Japan or in Asia. You write your artist name, and then you can either use the verb to paint, or you can use the noun picture, which is what Juki Ida used here. So this scroll is an extraordinary remembrance of the understanding between two individuals, a Japanese citizen and a Japanese American, both of whom, I believe, in the creation of our garden, came to understand themselves in the new post-World War II era. It was really quite a gift of uh, Dick Yamasaki to the University of Washington Botanical Gardens.